Judges 21. We're going to be finishing up our study in the book of Judges this morning. Then we've got next week is Father's Day. And as promised, just like I do every year, at Mother's Day, I always say, guys, a month from now, your message is coming. So as promised, next week, there will be a message for the men. And uh, so please be here for that. Be here for Father's Day. Looking forward to that next Sunday. Uh, But this morning, we'll finish up our series on the book of Judges. And as I was considering a couple things, how we're finishing up, I got to reminiscing a little bit about when we got our dog uh, at our house. Our dog's name is Waffles. Some of you have met Waffles. I did not name Waffles. Waffles was a rescue named Waffles when we got her. I would not call a dog Waffles. Uh, I recently found out that my supervisor, his kids have, uh, I think it was a rabbit, and they've named it Bagels. So I don't know why people would use the breakfast food to call their animals, but nonetheless, our dog's name is Waffles. We got Waffles about five and a half years ago, and uh, whenever we first got Waffles, we didn't have a fenced-in yard in Georgia, and so we would have to take her outside you know, to do her stuff on a leash. But she also had so much energy. She still has a pretty good bit, but nothing like she had then. She just was all energy all the time. And uh, she has, she's part terrier. And so that's where a lot of that energy comes from. And uh, so she just wanted to run. So we would take her on a leash and we would just run around the yard. But the thing is, there were a number of times where she got loose. Either the collar we found out wasn't tight enough or she was just running and we couldn't keep up and she took the leash right out of our hands. And if we were lucky, we caught her in our next door neighbor's yard. But there were a number of times, if anyone was watching, I was that guy running down the road, get back here, Waffles, yelling at the dog, just sprinting down the road, either barefoot or in flip flops, trying to catch our dog. And I would usually catch up to her about three or four houses down the road. You know, and it just, it always got to me like, why is she running? Like she was, we adopted her. We we brought her into our house. It was love at first sight. We just spent all this time spoiling her and feeding her and taking care of her. Someone's not happy back there. Um, So, uh, but we we took all this time and and energy just pouring out our love on her and, uh, and taking care of her. And so why after all of that, Would she want to run away? Why would she want to try to see what was in the neighbor's yard when we were definitely taking care of her in our yard? Well, after a few weeks of of doing this and chasing her stuff, I went and got one of those invisible fences. You know, uh, it's it's this little box that we had in the garage and I set the set the boundaries for it, the perimeter. and, and, And so it was only so far were they supposed to be able to go because then we put a collar on waffles. And this collar, what it would do is as she got close to the boundary, it would start to vibrate. It's kind of like a little warning. Hey, careful. (laughs) She got a little bit closer, it started buzzing, making a sound. And if she got too far, if she crossed that boundary, it gave a little shock. Now, it wasn't like you see in cartoons, you know, when there's a shock and and you see like the, the skeleton light up. It wasn't like that. It was just enough to get her attention that she's like, whoa, I didn't like that. And another thing that I did, because it wouldn't have been really fair just to throw her out there with no warning. So what you do when you have this invisible fence, it comes with these little white flags. And so I went and I marked our yard. And it was in the winter, so it wasn't any worry about the grass growing or having to mow over these. So I was able to set these flags out in the yard and mark where she was able to go. And it was this visible warning. If you go past this mark, you're going to feel the pain. So in addition to the vibrating and the buzzing and then the the actual shock, she had this visible warning. And, And, you know, it wasn't too long, just a few weeks that she got the message. And, and we don't, I mean, even now, we don't put her on a, a leash anymore or anything whenever she goes outside. She, she's free to go out there. But now she doesn't take off running. And why is that? It's because when we're still in Georgia, we, we set some, some uh, boundaries for her. We taught her the boundaries. We, we explained in, with the collar, you know, because just talking to her. Now, listen, honey, if you go, that wouldn't have worked. All right. But but with the collar, we explained the the limits that she was able to go and the punishment if she exceeded that, if she crossed the boundary. You know, what? Waffles learned the lesson. Lesson learned, like mission accomplished. Within just a few weeks, we didn't have any more problems. As a matter of fact, I went and took the flags away after a little while. And even without the visible reminder of the punishment, she still would not go past that. Because if she got close, it would start to vibrate. She would remember, oh, 
yeah, I don't want, I don't want the two steps to come after this. So she would back up. You know, I was, I was thinking about that again as we finish up this book of Judges. How that sometimes, or I might even say oftentimes, we as God's children tend to push the limits, don't we? God has set boundaries for us and he has said, hey, if you will just follow my word, if you will just listen to me and, and yield to my Holy Spirit, look, it, it will go well for you. And so often as God's children, we say, okay, well, God said, here's the boundary. I wonder how close I can get to that boundary. I wonder, wait, oh, okay. Wait a second, I just, all right, I, I'm not supposed to do that. Okay, I got that. I wonder if he's watching now. And, and, and we, we keep testing, we keep testing those boundaries. And, and then we end up, okay, look, I'm still alive. Like God said, don't do this. I just did it and he didn't strike me down. Well, I'm just going to go on past it then. And when we go past the boundaries that God has put in our lives, it's as though we think that these boundaries are there for our harm. It's as though we think that these boundaries, like God's just holding out on us. God doesn't want us to have all the fun that other people are having that aren't his children. So, so I, I want to go past that boundary. I want to blow right past it and, and see what happens. And then what happens is that chastening hand of God that we've seen throughout the book of Judges that we read about in Hebrews. Suddenly we feel that. And just like Waffles, those first couple times, she might have passed those flags and, whoa, zzz, oh, that's not fun. We go past and we feel the pain. We experience the punishment. We experience that chastening hand of God. We say, whoa, that's, okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to get right. I'm, I'm coming back to you. But unlike Waffles, you know what? We sadly so often don't learn the lesson. And we've seen that in the book of Judges. The book of Judges covers three to 400 years of history in, in, in the nation of Israel and here we're going to look at the very last verse in the book. We actually looked at this early on in the series because I, I set up the series with you knowing things don't go well. Like in the book of Judges, I didn't want to set you up like, oh, it starts off bad, but oh, it's, it's a happy ending and everything's great at the end. No, I let you know from the beginning, it doesn't turn out well. And so now we're back at the end, having looked at the entire book of Judges, three or four hundred years of Israel's history. And now we're at the end. And they still haven't learned their lesson. I mean, if we were to go back, if we were to do a pop quiz today, like tell me somebody uh, that uh, a nation that, that uh, afflicted the nation of Israel during the book of Judges. You know, someone might call out and say the Ammonites, the Amorites, the Philistines. You, you might have a different idea. Oh, this happened, this happened. Because we see over and over again, they rebelled against God. God said, do this. They said, well, let's do the other thing, the thing that he said not to do. And they felt the punishment of God because they crossed the boundaries. They went too far. They, they ignored God. And so we see over and over again in the nation of Israel and in our own lives many times, that cycle that we've talked about over and over. They would sin. They would sorrow. They would suffer. And then God would provide, or sin, suffer, they would sorrow, and then God would provide salvation. You see, they went through this cycle over and over because they never learned the lesson. So this morning, I want us to close out this series in a message I've entitled, Lessons Not Learned. Lessons Not Learned. Now, I'm not going to give you a list of every single lesson they should have learned, but I want this whole idea that, hey, sometimes you look at someone like, oh man, they learned their lesson. Like, they're never going to do that again. Nikki tells a story of when she was a little girl, they had a furnace that uh, her dad would say, don't touch that, it's hot. And of course, Nikki being the rebellious person that she is, I mean, I'm sorry, sorry, I missed foe. I meant was. <laughs> um, she, uh, she would always go and want to touch it. Now, I'm not telling you like she was 17 or 18 years old, like she was little. Okay, six months, she says. I think she's probably a little bit older than that because, you know, but... Anyway, so she would, she would go over to this furnace and her dad would say, no, it's hot. So finally one day her, her dad said, there's only one way she can learn. And she touched it. And then she said, oh, hot, hot. <laughs> she learned. She didn't mess with it anymore. See, she learned the lesson. But so often, God's children go through life, rebel, experience the punishing hand of God, experience that chastening hand of God, and we fail to learn the lessons that he's trying to teach us. And so we want to look at it this morning, lessons not learned. You know, as, as we've studied the book of Judges, I've found it extremely depressing. Like I've told, if you were with us back in January when we kicked off this series, I told you that I initially wanted to study this book 
uh, two years ago when we finished studying the book of Joshua. Like I wanted to finish Joshua and jump straight into Judges and the Lord just didn't give me peace about doing that. So it was a year and a half after that before I got to start this series. I was excited about it in January. I was still excited about it at the beginning of February. Somewhere around that I was like, man, this is awful. God, do I have to finish the book of Judges? He's like, yeah, finish Judges. There's lessons. There's lessons you need to learn that they didn't. And so we've continued in the book of Judges, but it's so depressing to me because no matter how many times God came through for Israel, they still rebelled. No matter how many times they, that, that God showed his love to them and he took care of them and he provided them a home and he, he took uh, just every care that they needed. He, he had it you know, well in hand. They would rebel. It's like that idea, like with my dog, like no matter what we did for her, no matter how many toys we bought her, she'd get outside and say, hey, I wonder what's happening down the road. And that's what, that's what God's people do so many times. I, I wonder what's happening down the road. God's just trying to keep me boxed in. I bet there's something better past his boundaries. And so as we've studied the book of Judges, man, I found it depressing because th they just continue to do the same thing over and over again to the same uh, harmful results. And then I look at him like, man, that's just like us. And that's where it gets depressing. Like, when are we going to learn? Like, see, at least they didn't have the Bible. I mean, they couldn't say, hey, we'll turn over to the book of, they couldn't do that. We can, like we should be able to learn the lessons from them and their failures. But so many times God's people today, we just completely ignore God's word. We completely ignore the examples that we have set before us. And we're like, hey, let's try this out. It hasn't ever worked for us before, but let's rebel against God and see how it goes this time. And we don't learn the lessons. And so I find it depressing. I find it insane. As someone has said at some point in time, that insanity, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, it's like we walk into that wall over there and boom, oh, that's solid. I can't go through it. Let me try it again. And we just keep banging against that wall thinking at some point that wall is going to give. It doesn't happen. And that's how we walk through life so many times. We rebel against God. We just bang our heads against the wall thinking at some point it'll change. God will change his mind. He'll slack up. He'll let us rebel and get away with it. And it doesn't happen. This morning we want to look at one verse. Now one verse as our text. I'm going to give you a lot of verses in the body of the message. But Judges 21, 25. Again we cover this verse multiple times during this series and we looked at it extensively in our third week of our series but Judges 21 25 says this in those days there was no king in Israel now just pause here for a moment I've said this before but if you weren't here I'll say it again this is not giving an excuse for what we're about to read this is simply a statement a time frame a statement of fact in those days there was no king in Israel all right. Many times we'll read that. Some will read that and think, OK, well, that explains why the next thing happened. No, it's telling us when, when, did, when was Israel like that? Well, it was in the time when there was no king in Israel. Oh, OK. So it was OK. So it was before the kings. Got it. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And look at this last half. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, if you were with us the last few weeks, you know, we finished up with the life of Samson. And we last week we looked at this unnamed Levite who was willing to serve basically the highest bidder. It was basically this preacher just said, hey, whoever can pay me the most, take care of me the most. That's who I'm going to go and just tell them, yeah, God said this or that or whatever. And basically just preach what they wanted to hear. And we saw that last week and that, that ended in chapter 18. So you may be wondering, OK, we're at 21, 25. What happened to 19 and 20 and the rest of 21? I told you at the beginning that the book of Judges is not the, the beginning of the series. When I first started preaching this back in January, I mentioned that the book of Judges is not for the faint of heart. There are some stories in the book of Judges that I've glossed over. There are some stories in the book of Judges I've just kind of skipped over and said, look, there's some stuff that happens here. Read it on your own. I'm not going to discuss it in a message. You, you can just read into it. Chapter 19, 20 and 21. It's a chunk, but I felt it best to skip over it. Because quite frankly, whenever I read over this again, I, I, I was reminded a lot when I read it, I was reminded of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet there's some things that happen in chapter 19 that are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. 
So think about that, because when we look at the Bible, we think, oh, man, wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, God just destroyed them and because of their wickedness. But when we read chapter 19, and if you want to read that on your own time, do that. Some of the things that happen are worse than what we read about Sodom and Gomorrah. And so just in chapter 19, we read, I mean, just in the, the first few verses, we, we, we see adultery, we see uh, uh, drunkenness, we, we see uh, murder, we, we see uh, uh, immorality, we see deceit, and those are just the things that I'll name. There's a, there's a lot going on in chapter 19. Chapter 20 then, it deals with how the nation of Israel responded to everything that happened in 19. You see, in chapter 19, there was one tribe that all of that wickedness was going in, uh, going on in. And they decided, hey, while we may not agree with everything that happened, we're also not going to deal with everything that happened. And so the rest of the nation of Israel came up against the one tribe and said, OK, we're going to wipe you out. And so their response wasn't, you know, to speak to this tribe and try to get them right with God and bring them back into fellowship with the other nation, other other tribes of Israel. No, it was we're going to wipe them out. And so there was this civil war that happened. And we read that these other uh, tribes of Israel, they went to God a couple times. But their responses to what God said and their responses to this other tribe, it just seems very off compared to what we read in Scripture and what we read of how God wants us to deal with sin. And, and so we had one tribe saying, we'll just cover sin and look the other way and act like it never happened. The rest of the tribe responding to that sin and to that tribe in a way that really wasn't good. I, I, I had this image of just their moral compass just spinning constantly. Every, every tribe of Israel, they're just, they're, they're conscious, or their compass, their moral compass is just spinning. It's like they have no clear direction. They don't know what to do, even though God had told them over and over again. And so that's, that's just kind of, a, again, glossing over chapters 19 through 21. And then it gets us to 21, 25. Everybody just did right in their own eyes. And so whenever I read this, these passages and I, I got to thinking about this, everyone doing right in their own eyes again. Remember I said this study has been really depressing. And it's because I look around and I see it happening over and over again. I, I see God's people just rebelling against him, doing right in their own eyes, doing whatever they want. And, and it's just depressing. I see the moral compass of so many Christians spinning because is this okay, to, okay today? Is, is this okay today? Or maybe this is okay. And, and they're just, they're seeking for answers, but they're going in all the wrong places for those answers. And so this morning, as we consider this lessons not learned, I, I see a few things as we draw to a close on our book, our, our study of the book of Judges. I, I see a few things that Israel struggled with over and over again that I think we as the church of God struggle with also. The first thing I see is that they had no true standard for right and wrong. They had no true standard for right and wrong. If every man did that which was right in his own eyes, then there was no true fixed standard. If you were to go to 10 different people and give them a scenario and say, okay, what would you do in this situation? You might get seven or eight different answers. Maybe a couple people would agree, but you know, hey, here's this tough situation. What would you do? There's going to be all these different answers. Why? Because everyone has their own idea of what's right. Everyone has their own idea of what they should do in a given situation. Everyone has their own experiences that they're going to draw from. And they say, based on my life, based on what I've seen, here's how I would handle that situation. And, and so we see every man, if they just do right in their own eyes, it's going to be all over the place. Oh, well, that's just my truth. That's a statement we'll hear people make. Well, my truth is this or, or the way I think what's right for me is this rather than what does God's word say? You see, there's no true standard for right and wrong. And I want you to understand today I'm preaching to God's people. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. In the church, in, in the church of God, and I'm just, not just talking about one specific church, our church, I'm talking the church of God at large around the world. Too many Christians have no true standard for right and wrong. It's whatever feels good, do it. it, it it's, it's just drawing on my own desires. Instead of saying, uh, so, many, so often, instead of saying, thus saith the Lord, and that's the standard that is, is to be set for right and wrong. We've got professing believers that will continually say, just follow your heart. Just do you. 
Just be the best version of you. Whatever you feel, then just do that. Follow that. If you feel it, it must be right. And I'm not, again, we hear some of that stuff in the world. The world is the world. I'm talking to Christians today. Those are not the directions we are to give each other. Those are not the directions we are to give our kids. We ought to be saying, hey, you follow what the Lord says. You follow his word. You follow God. Stay submitted to his spirit and do what he tells you to do. Because that is a true source, a true standard of right and wrong. But unfortunately, we don't hear that very often. Instead of that one fixed standard that we can all look to in the storms of life, we tell people just to keep your eyes on the things that change every single day. I mean, I, think, I want you to think about that. Some of you ladies, when you were 16 years old, in your heart, did you just know that you were going to marry a Backstreet Boy? Or, I'm sorry, maybe some of y'all are older than that, a new kid on the block. Or, or maybe, I'm sorry, maybe some of you are older than that, and I'm sorry, I'm not. So, whoever it was back then, like you just knew at 16, in your heart of hearts, this is who I'm going to marry. Did that change for you? I mean, probably so. Maybe some of you are still holding out hope. But probably... That changed. Why? Because your heart changed. Your emotions changed. Some of you guys, you know, you, you'd, you'd bench press that, you know, 25 pound bar, no weights on it. And you thought, yep, that's it. I'm going pro. I'm going to be a pro football player. Or, or I, you know what? You watched Macho Man Randy Savage or Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan. And you're like, I can do that. You just wait. Give me another couple years. I'm going to be as big as Hulk Hogan. I'm going to be a professional wrestler. How'd that work out for you? I, I don't know. I mean, maybe some of you did, but I haven't heard about it. You, you see, we all have these things in our heart. We all have these feelings. We all have these ideas. And if all we live our lives based on is what's in our heart, what's that feeling? What's it, what do I feel like today? Then you're going to go off pursuing something that isn't what God has for you. And it's going to change. It's going to be 100 miles an hour one way. Like, this is right. This is what I'm supposed to do. And then two weeks later, this is right. This is what I'm supposed to do. But what happened to that? Oh, that was, that, was, that was two weeks ago. That's old news. It's this now. And I'm not saying that we don't change as God directs us. God says, hey, start, talk, start walking and I'll tell you the next step. And so sometimes God sends us in a direction. We're like, all right, God, I'm following you. He's like, good. Now take a left turn. But you were leaving me. I know. And I said, take a left. Okay, well, I'll go this way now, God. See, sometimes God directs our steps and changes our direction, uh, testing our obedience, testing our faith. But that's okay for him to do that because he's still that standard. He's saying, follow me. Okay, I'm following you, God. Now you're going left, God. Now you're going right, God. I'm following you, though. As opposed to, well, I just feel it in my heart today that this is the right thing to do. I just feel that this is uh, what's true to me today. No, we need to keep our eyes fixed on a true standard for right and wrong. We need to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. We need to fix our eyes on the, his word, on his son. And Malachi 3, 6 says this, for I am the Lord. I change not. God doesn't change. If God said something with sin 2,000 years ago, then he says it's sin today. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It's still sin. And Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The same Jesus that came to die for your sins. 2,000 years ago, he, he's the same today. He, he still loves you despite your sin. He still loves you even though you're a sinner, but he's still calling you to himself. And he's still calling you away from your sin. It, just like the woman caught in adultery, did he say, oh, okay, all of your accusers are gone. Whew, you dodged a bullet that time. No, he says, go and sin no more. He called her out of her sin. He didn't say stay there. When he met the woman at the well and he said, go call your husband. And she's like, well, I don't have a husband. He's like, you're right. You've had five of them. And the one you're living with now isn't even your husband. He, he exposed her sin to give her the, the knowledge of the fact that she needed a savior. That's the same thing that Jesus is doing today. He's not glossing over anybody's sin. He's not saying, well, if you say that's love, then it must be love. Because who am I to say? No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still calling us out of our sin, not to love us in our sin so that we can stay there. He's loving us while we are sinners so that he can call us out of our sins. We must fix our eyes on the Lord. He is the one that we need to trust in. We can't lean to our own understanding. We can't just do what feels good and every one of us do right in our own eyes. We are called to trust him, not our hearts. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord lean with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't just lean on, well, I think this is probably okay. I think this is, I think it feels, 
No, he says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 10. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Look at this next part. Just follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. James said, hey, follow your heart. Follow what you think is right. No, he says, submit to the Lord. Submit to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know what happens when we teach our kids and those around us just do what you think is right? Hey, whatever's right for you, that's what you should do. What happens is what we read in Judges chapter 2. What we read is that passage that I couldn't get out of my mind for the last couple of years as I watch what's happening in society, as I watch what happens in our churches, as I watch what's happening among our young people. Judges chapter 2 verses 10 through 12. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and... There arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. You see, when you just do what you feel is right without consulting God, without focusing on his word, when you just do what you think is right inside your own heart of hearts, you just say, I, I feel like this is what I should do. We end up raising a generation that knows not God. And I got to tell you, as I look around, I think we're close. I think we're close to raising that generation that doesn't know God. I think we're close to having that generation that has no idea of what God has done for his church and for his people. I think we're close to having that generation like the nation of Israel had in Judges chapter 2. Because if we're not focusing on him as our righteous standard for right and wrong, then what are we focusing on? Ourselves. And, and we're told that our hearts are desperately wicked. We're told that we can't know what's right or wrong apart from him. And so you see over the last few decades, there are sins that have become more acceptable. There are, there are sins that are socially celebrated. And God's people, because we don't want to seem mean. God's people, because we don't want to make people angry, have just gone along with it. And there's no true standard for right and wrong anymore in the church of God. Our moral compass is spinning because everything goes. Now, I'm not saying all of God's children live that way. There are some that are standing that are saying, no, I'm going to follow God regardless of what it may cost me. But unfortunately, there's not enough of them. There's not enough people like that standing up because all of God's children should be. We all should be standing up saying, no, this isn't right. But I shared something with you whenever we first started this series. I said the sin that one generation tolerates the next generation will embrace. And we've seen that. Because previous generations, rather than standing up and saying, no, this isn't right, this doesn't please God, they've sat back. They've tolerated sin. And so those future generations that have come, each successive generation is worse and worse and embraces sin more and more. So we see one of the things that we can learn from the book of Judges is that the nation of Israel, they had no true standard for right and wrong. But not only that, I see that they had no lasting sorrow over their sin. They had no lasting sorrow over their sin. How many times in the book of Judges did we see that the nation of Israel sinned against God and he brought punishment? And so they cried out to him, God, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Please stop punishing us. And he would deliver them. Only for some number of years later, it would be a little while. Maybe it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, okay, we need to... We need to be careful. Y'all remember what happened last time, right? And so they would, they would sorrow over their sin. They would stay right with God for a while. Remember I told you whenever I took away the visible reminder of the boundary from Waffles, she had learned her lesson so she didn't try to push that limit. 
for us and for the nation of Israel, you know what happens when that visible reminder of God's punishment, that visible reminder of the boundaries is removed? So often we think, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad. I remember whenever I did this thing and God punished me, it, you know, it wasn't that bad. The, the, the thing was, I think the thing was so fun, so enjoyable, it was worth a little bit of punishment. And so when we lose sight of that visible reminder, perhaps for some it's the scars that you bear from that time where you rebelled against God. And those scars start to fade and now you think, you know, I, I remember the fun I used to have. I, I remember hanging out with that crowd and all the things that we would do and I enjoyed that. And so as those scars fade, as that visible reminder fades, we don't have that lasting sorrow of our sin. Sin doesn't seem so sinful to us anymore. We only remember what we think of as the, quote unquote, good times. Remember I told you uh, recently in some message, I talked about how sometimes I'll joke about the good old days. And the good old days, whenever I joke, like when I joke about that with Nikki, the good old days were when I had my own apartment and I was single and I came and went as I wanted. But see, the good old days, a lot of times we build those up in our mind. Because when I really think about the good old days, I ate a lot of tuna fish. I, I ate a lot of frozen pizzas. And I had a lot of frozen chicken tenders. And that was pretty much my entire diet for a year and a half. The good old days, I, I eat a whole lot better today than I did back then. The good old days aren't quite as good as they were. I, I remember there were, there were days where it was pretty lonely. See, the good old days, we, we build those up in our mind. You know what happens in, in our lives as Christians? We start reminiscing about the good old days, the sin that we used to live in, and we build it up. We forget the results of that sin. We forget what it put us through. And so there's no lasting sorrow over that sin. And, and so we see here that the, the, the nation of Israel, I mean, I don't think that there was not true repentance. There was. It's just it didn't last you see, a true understanding of our sin and a true understanding of what it does to the heart of God should cause us to repent of that. That means that word repent means to turn from. And so if sin is over here and we've embraced it and we've, we've lived in that sin, to repent of sin means we turn from it. But we don't just turn from it to nothing. We, to repent means to turn from one thing to another. So we turn from our sin to the Savior. And we confess our sins. We, we forsake them. God, I, I'm coming back to you. I repent of this. I get rid of this. I confess it. I sinned against you, God. Please forgive me. I, I'm turning back to you. And so repentance, true repentance lasts. That's sin. I'm done with it. I'm only, I, I'm, I'm all with God now. But what happens in our lives so often as Christians, again, we start, we, we, we romanticize the good old days. So we're, I'm all about you, God. It's all you, but I mean, I remember, I love you, I love you, Lord. Oh, I lift your, I lift your name, but, and, and we start looking back. You see, start, as soon as you start looking back, it's really easy just to go on back. And, and so that we see one of the things that Israel suffered from was no lasting sorrow over their sin. Paul said this about godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned from it and turned to God? Then stop looking over your shoulder. There was nothing but death and misery back there. Don't romanticize and be like, oh, the good old days were so great. Oh, the good old days. Oh, man, you remember hugging the toilet every morning and you were as sick as a dog as you went out the night before? Man, that was awesome. Yeah. You, you, you romanticize the partying, but you forget about the day after. You, you romanticize the relationships that you had and forget about the heartache that came because of them. And there, we could just keep going down this list. There's so many things that we could talk about. But we forget what the good old days really were. It was sin and it was separation from God and it was punishment and chastening at his hand. So our sorrow doesn't last, the sorrow of our sin. There's one more thing I want to share with you. Not only did the nation of Israel have no true standard for right and wrong, not only did they have no lasting sorrow for their sin, but this perhaps is the biggest thing, and it actually shows why the other things happened. And it's so evident in our world today, too. They had no real fear of the Lord. There was no real fear of the Lord. 
Despite all that they had seen, despite all that they had suffered, despite all that they had experienced throughout the book of Judges, three or four hundred years. Now, listen, I mean, I want to emphasize that three or four hundred years, not, you know, a few weeks, a few hours, not a couple months, three to four hundred years they had gone through this cycle. 300 to 400 years they had experienced the chastening hand of God, the punishment of God. And this was not light. I mean, it wasn't that, you know, they, got, they, had, they were told they had to go sit in the corner with their nose in the corner. Like, it wasn't go sit on a timeout. That wasn't when God punished his people to get their attention. It wasn't sitting on a timeout, but yet you still have all your stuff. I remember when we studied Gideon, the, 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 the enemies of Israel would come in and steal away everything, all of their crops, all of their cattle. It was so bad that Gideon had just a little bit of wheat. And rather than being up on the threshing floor, threshing the wheat where everyone knows that's where you thresh the wheat and, and where it's the most effective, he was hiding with his little bit of wheat down in the, the wine press so that no one could see him. You see, it wasn't that things were good. It was just a little time out. God just slapped us on the wrist. No, when God said, okay, I'm going to get your attention, he went all out. But yet, despite all of that, the people had no real fear of the Lord. As you look around you today, how many people truly act like they fear the Lord? People are going to live the way they want to live. They're going to do what they want to do. As a matter of fact, I mean, the entire month of June is set aside in many places to celebrate sin. In our, in our embassies, they're flying the gay pride uh, flags. Uh, our vice president walked in the gay pride parade in D.C. yesterday. There, there's a corporation after corporation saying, oh, we'll change our logo this month to show that we support uh, you know, homosexuality. We support all the different initials there. Uh, tell me, does that represent a people that have a fear of the Lord? Listen, God loves each and every person regardless of what sin they embrace. God loves them and calls them to himself away from that sin. We see so many of God's people are saying, they're embracing the same thing and saying it's okay because after all, love is love and it's all whatever goes. There's no fear of God. What does God say? Not what do I think because of everything I've been told by those voices around me, but what do, what do I think because of what God says? What does God say? Unfortunately, there's no real fear of the Lord. Why is it so important that we fear him? Consider a number of verses here. Psalm 110, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Rather than fearing, and that word fear means to, to be in awe of, to reverence, to respect. Rather than uh, or respecting God and reverencing him for who he is and his position. I mean, he's the one that spoke everything into existence. He's the one that just sustains us by the word of his mouth. He's the one that, because of him, the planets don't just spin off in every direction. We're not burned up by our sun being just a little bit too close to us. All of that because of God. But yet we don't have a proper respect of God. We think, ah. I'll do what I want to do. And who is he to tell me what to do? Hey, the big guy upstairs can just stay there because I... No, no, no. A proper respect and fear of God doesn't look at him as the big guy upstairs. The, the proper fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. But, you know, fools, they despise wisdom and instruction. Who's he to tell me what to do? Proverbs eight thirteen: the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and all the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity or sin is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. A proper fear of God says, I don't want sin I want God. We can look around and see that there's not a fear of God because too many people, God's own people even, are embracing sin rather than him. Finally, Proverbs 23, 17, let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. It doesn't get a whole lot clearer than that. Don't envy sinners. 
Don't look at those living in sin and be like, man, lucky. I wish I could be doing that, but I'm a Christian. Ugh. That's how a lot of God's children live. Don't envy sinners. You live in the fear of the Lord. You, you, you recognize that those who are apart from Christ, they are doomed. They are destined for hell, except that they receive Jesus as their Savior. And so that is not something to envy. That is something to pity. That is something to share with them the good news of the gospel of Christ. It is not something to say, well, I'll just hang out with them, but I won't do the things they do. I'll just, you know, no, you are to be a light. You are to be salt and light in this world. You are to tell them about Jesus and not embrace or accept the sin that they live in. And so we see, let not thine heart envy sinners, be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. I'm sure there's many things we could pull out of judges, lessons they didn't learn. But three that jumped out at me is that they didn't have a true standard of right and wrong. They had no true standard of right and wrong. Their moral compass was just spinning. They had no lasting sorrow over their sin. They would sin, they would get right, and then they would, huh. I remember we had a pretty good time back then. There was no real fear of the Lord. Like I said, the saddest thing I found in the book of Judges is that, man, we are doing the same thing today. We are going through the same cycle today. And we'll say, oh, God, I love you. I'm going to sing your praises on Sunday morning. And then I got Monday through Saturday to do whatever I want. Or even some, it's I've got Sunday afternoon all the way through Saturday to do whatever I want. Because I gave God my hour on Sunday morning. Unfortunately, the moral compass of God's people is spinning. Uh, we're raising our kids to live that life that embraces everything but God, except on Sunday morning. I saw some, somebody post, and I didn't write it down, so I won't quote it exactly, but they said something like uh, that, that we are basically four, I think it was something like four generations or four steps from having people that are our children that don't know God. And it's something to the effect of, you know, one, one uh, set of parents just uh, makes church optional. So then to their kids, you know, they see it as, well, we'll go every now and then, but then they just go every now and then. So then their kids feel like they just don't even need to go. And then their kids, they don't even know who God is or what church is. And unfortunately, that's where many families are today. Many of God's people today are in that, eh, we'll go or we won't go. It's not a big deal. Previous generations wouldn't have missed a service. They would have been there for everything going on. They love God. They want to serve God, do anything he wants. Each generation gets a little bit further. So where are we in that step? Are we at already at two, maybe three? We're getting close to people that don't even know God. I, I you know, want you to think about if, if, if someone is lost in a desert, do you tell that person, hey, just look within yourself. Just look within yourself and you'll find your way out. If you just follow your heart, you'll get out of that desert. They're going to follow their heart and they're going to be dead in that desert, right? No, they don't, they don't need to look inside themselves, look in their heart to find their way out. What do they need? They need a map. They need a landmark. They need something fixed that they can set their eyes on. They need a star and say, okay, I know that way is north, so I'm going to fix my eyes on that because I remember there was a town to the north, so I need to go that way. See, they need something fixed and firm. They need a standard, not oh, whatever I feel like. You've, you've seen in movies or you've heard of different times someone being stuck in a desert and what? Oh, it looks like there's something over there. I'll just head that way and it's a mirage. It looked like something. Oh, I, because there wasn't anything true. It was something fake. That's where a lot, where a lot of God's people are. I'm going to go towards that. That looks like happiness over there. But it was a lie. Oh, then now I'm going to go that way because that's happiness no, it's fake over there. We need to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. We need to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Him. We need to just stop this temporary sorrow over our sin. Oh, man, I feel bad, God. I did that again. Oh, okay, God, for real this time. No, I mean, it's all it's you and me, right? I'll be right back with you, God. We've got to stop the temporary sorrow over our sin. We've got to live a life where we fear God, we respect God, we recognize who He is, and that we owe everything to Him. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you didn't do that. Like, there was nothing that you did to earn heaven. There was nothing you did to clean up yourself. He did all of that. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. Why would you think now that, okay, well, He's forgiven me, I've got my ticket to heaven, now I can just go live however I want to. He gave His life so that you don't have to live in your sin. But too often times we go back to it over and over again. We don't fear him. We think we're in charge. 
As we close the study of the book of Judges this morning, hey, if you're content to go through the motions, don't do anything. You're good. Hey, if you're content to live that cycle over and over of sinning and then suffering and then sorrowing, salvation, and you're content to just live that pain over and over, don't do anything. You're good. If you're content to live a life that's not blessed by God, live a life that, that you know, okay, I'll call on you when I need you, but I'm going to live my own life. And if you're content with that, then, hey, don't do anything. You're good. But if you actually want to live a life pleasing to God, if you want to live a life that says, hey, God, I don't want my sin. I want my Savior. I don't want to live for that. I want to live for you. God, I, I know what you did for me. I know what it cost you. And I know you are the one that is high and holy. And you deserve all of my attention, all of my praise, all of my affection. God, I don't want my sin that was destroying my life because I recognize that would just kill me. God, I just want you. Then repent. Turn away from that and turn towards him. Just stop playing with sin like it's some, some pet that you can just play with a little bit. No, it, it, it wants, it, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. It's been his, his goal from the beginning. He wants none of us to live for God. So stop playing with sin and turn to God. Live in fear of him. Don't follow your heart. Follow his word. God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? What does your spirit say to me? Lead me, guide me in every step. I don't want to take a step unless you tell me to. I don't want to be going the wrong way because I thought, oh, it looks good over there. I think I'll go that way. I only want to go where you want me to go. The only hope for future generations is that we get right with God. Is that we cry out to him and say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for following my own heart. I'm sorry for telling other people to follow their hearts or their feelings or whatever. God, I want to follow you. If you want to do that, then you need to get right. If you've been living the life that says, oh, look, sin, oh, that looks pretty good. You've got to repent of that. You've got to turn to him. You've got to live in the fear of God. Have that fixed standard of right and wrong. And there may be somebody here today, you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior to begin with. You can't live for him. All you know is the life of living for yourself and living for sin because... With the sin that's in your life, you can't live for God. God says this about all of our goodness, all of our righteousness before we come to Christ. He says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. You, you take the nastiest, dirtiest laundry you can, whether it's been somebody's been out working all day on the farm, you know, rolling around in all the stuff that comes with the farm and the mud and the muck and all of that. And then they come in and they drop all that right there on the laundry room floor. And you're like, man, that's disgusting. We might just need to go ahead and burn those. There's no hope. That's how good you are on your own. Apart from Jesus Christ, that's all of your good works. It's worthless. But the good news is, and it is good news, the gospel, that word gospel means good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ came. He gave his life. He died on a cross to pay for your sins and for mine, for the sins of all the world. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so if there's anyone here that's never placed their faith in Jesus Christ, stop trying to do life on your own. Stop trying to be a good person because you can't. Give it all to Christ. Jesus died to pay for your sins. And then, who knows? I mean, there, when I say if there's anybody, I mean anybody. I mean, if you were born and stepped into a church the next day, you probably wouldn't have stepped, but someone carried you. But if you, you've been in church your entire life, I don't care. That doesn't get you to heaven. Being at every single service doesn't get you to heaven. Teaching a Sunday school class doesn't get you to heaven. Being the pastor doesn't get you to heaven. Except that we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we will not enter heaven. Matthew 7, Jesus said, there are going to be a lot of people that come to me saying, look at all this good stuff we did, and we even used your name when we did it. And he's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because I never knew you. Apart from coming to Jesus Christ, recognizing we are nothing but worthless sinners, saying, Jesus, I want you to save me. I, I confess that I, I recognize you died on the cross to pay for my sin, and apart from you, I can't get to heaven. God, save me. Apart from that, you're doomed and destined for hell. So if there's anyone here that's never placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior, do that today. Don't, don't delay. If there's anyone here today that says, man, I've been living that life that I just do whatever I feel like's right. I haven't been focused on the Lord and only following Him. Get right today. Stop living for yourself. Stop living with that broken moral compass just spinning. Live for the Lord. Let's pray.
Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you today as we finish up our study in the book of Judges. Such a, a hard passage to study or a hard book to study. There's so much in it that, Lord, it's scary how much it reminds me of our, our world today and, and your people today. We will chase after everything if we think it'll give us a momentary little bit of happiness. We, we ignore the fact that you have set out a path for us to walk. You've told us to follow you, to trust you, to not lean on our own understanding, but yet we continually go back to what we think is right. We, we romanticize the good old days of sin. We forget about the pain and the suffering. We, we, we think about, oh, well, man, that sure was a good time back then. God, I pray you wake up your people. Show us our need to be right with you, to live for you, Lord. Because here's the thing, if we don't, we're losing the next generation. And we're losing the generation after that and after that. And before long, there's going to be a generation that comes up that has no idea anything about you. So, you know, there's some that today, this is just going to be like, yeah, okay, good, he's done. We're, we're over it. Let's go home. Because they're content. They're all right with the way things go. So they'll sit there. But Lord, if there's somebody else that you're speaking to today, I pray they'll cry out to you in repentance today. They'll get their lives right. Hey, it might be a, a mom and dad today that say, you know what? We haven't been fearing the Lord for ourselves and we haven't been setting a good example for our kids. And they would say today, hey, kids, things are going to change because we're going to focus on the Lord, not on ourselves. We're going to follow the Lord, not our feelings. We're going to we're going to focus on him. And that means, I mean, we're going to be faithful to him and we're going to do what he tells us to. God, I pray that you would speak to hearts today. If there's someone here today that's never been saved, may today be the day that they cry out to Jesus to, to be their Savior. Lord, you have your will and way in everything that's done in Jesus' name.